Our opening hymn today is number 110 in the United Methodist hymnal, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Please rise as you are able to. sound a lot better than last week. Just saying. So I just want to say uh, thank you to the congregation for allowing Raquel and Stormy and I to go to some training this past week. Um, it was marvelous. We had uh, really good workshops, a uh, really good time, and a lot of great ideas. So I think there's a lot of stuff we will be able to uh, work on and use all that information with. So thank you so much for allowing us to do that. Uh, we have a couple of prayer quilts up here. One is for um, Robert and Yvonne Holder's daughter, and the other is for Larry Titchener. So if you could um, say a prayer and then tie a knot, 
that would be marvelous. Um, once all the knots are tied, then we will present them to them. Um, and you know, if, if it looks like all the knots are already tied, that's okay. Say another prayer, tie another knot. Prayers, you can never have enough of them. So it's okay if there's a double knot there. Um, today is our Trunk or Treat uh, Fall Festival celebration. Thank you for all the um, candy donations. Um, it smells really good when you walk in my office. And uh, we will be starting to set up for Trunk or Treat right after worship service. It runs today from 1 to 3. If you are coming to open your trunk and hand out treats, if you could try and be here by 1230, that would be really helpful because we do put up flags so that people don't drive where kiddos will be walking. And we'd like to try and have all the cars into their proper locations before kiddos show up. So that would be really helpful. Um, tomorrow is our uh, book club, our monthly book club meeting. It is at 1030 in the morning in the youth room. We have been reading Truths I Never Told You by Kelly Rimmer, and I really enjoyed the book. Um, I haven't heard from anybody else yet, but I'm looking forward to the discussion about that. And then, I can't believe it because time has flown, but the craft fair is next Saturday. Uh, craft fair here is a really big event. Um, I have over 60 vendors coming, so we will clear out the entire church. Everything that you see everywhere in all of the rooms all comes into the middle of the sanctuary so that we can put all the vendor spaces in all the rest of the church. So we need help moving everything from everywhere it is into here. And we start doing that Friday morning at 9 a.m. So if there's anybody that can come and help, we um, sure would love to have you. We don't turn anybody away. Some stuff is heavy and needs more than uh, one person, and other stuff is just easy to pick up and move in here. And then again, we invite you to come shopping at the craft fair. Over 60 vendors. We have a really good variety of stuff this year. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And then we have to reset the church as soon as the event is over so that on Sunday morning everything's not piled in the middle of the sanctuary. So if anybody can come and help put the church back together on Saturday we start doing that at 3 p.m. So um, as always we remind you to fill out the little portion of, of the bulletin. Hope everyone picked one of those up. Um, put down how many are in your group and what seats you're sitting in. That helps us with contact tracing and it helps us with attendance. And then you drop those into the offering plates along with your offering, either up front here or in the back. So um, it is so good to see everyone this morning. It's a beautiful day outside. I hope everyone's doing all right. Wave, say hello. We're glad you're all here. And uh, one small announcement uh, from Music Ministries. Uh, just want to let everyone know the uh, Chancel Choir and the Praise Band will not be meeting this Wednesday as normal here. Uh, those members that are already part of the Chancel Choir know what we're doing instead on Wednesday. But if you try to come here and you find us, you will not find us this Wednesday. So just a heads up on that. And now we'll go into our call to prayer. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. We are back after three days in Santa Fe. And you know there's no better time of year to be in Santa Fe. It was absolutely gorgeous. And we do thank you. We do thank you for um, allowing us to go, helping to pay for that trip. Um, but we did. It was a good time. It was a good time. So um, while we were there, we met with um, other churches. There were several other churches there. And I, I have to tell you that, you know, we, we kind of think of, of church right here in, in this building. And um, we, we, we met a pastor who started his charge in, in Ju July of this year with two people in service. And we, and Todd, Todd Selau, who's preached here, he was there. And so um, we kind of got an inside look at how he's planning to move forward with his church, which doesn't have a building at all. So uh, it, was, it was really kind of inspiring to, to see how the church is going to move forward if you have to sell the building or if you don't have a building, you know? We always say the church is the people, um, but this was, this was real evidence of how people are, are learning how to do that. So that was good. That was good. Um, one of the exercises that we had that we were supposed to practice it, you know, Lecto Divina is, is hearing and reading the word, and this was Visio Divina. So you go out looking to see where you see God in, in the art, in the sculpture, in nature, in people. So we wandered around Santa Fe for about three hours, up and down Canyon Road, and went to the Basilica. Uh, oldest church, oldest house. Um, but it was, you know, you, if you look at things differently, you know, and sometimes you just need somebody to tell you, you got to do something different. So... I, so I'm listening now to the music and, and kind of reading the words, and so I, I think that's another way that we can offer our prayers. So um, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Creator, we come before you, and we are so thankful for what you have given to us. And, and I just marvel at your imagination. When I look at the, the number of trees, the different kinds of flowers, and how every single solitary human being is unique. I, I, I stand in awe of your creation. And then when I look up at the sky and see the stars and the moon, and, and even watch a plane cross over the horizon, you gave human beings the brains to build a machine. You gave people the desire, the vision to be able to fly. So we are thankful. And we are especially thankful for those people who, who take their talents and their gifts and they use them not only for themselves and their family but for uh, the betterment of, of your world. So bless them, Father. And bless us as we come into this place to worship you, to thank you, to pray for those who, who need prayers, whether it's because they're sick, whether it's because they're discouraged and depressed, whether it's because of illnesses, of the mind, of the body, whether it's needs, being hungry or thirsty or 
not having a warm place to, to go to bed. Lord, we pray for those especially who don't realize they need you. So, Lord, we come as your family, gathered in this space to learn, to grow, to offer encouragement to one another as we hear your word and seek to live out our mission. So hear our prayers for each other and hear our prayers as we offer it to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we're about to have some fun. Join in if you'd like. <laughs> nice okay I'm we're we're blessed this morning because we do have um, a guest speaker for a few minutes I'm blessed because I don't have to talk for those few minutes you're blessed because I don't have to talk for those few minutes <laughs> But we are delighted that David Sargent, who is, um, he's with Gideon's International, and it says right here he's president. I, I, what are you president of? It's the Rio Rancho Camp. 
president of the Rio Rancho camp. So, and he has come to, to share about Gideon's. New Mexico banditos, hell's angels, prisoners, seafarers, alcoholics, drug abusers, you, me. What could we possibly have in common? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. How did the Gideons get their name? If you look in the book of Judges, chapters 6, 7, and 8, and I paraphrase, God called on Gideon, who was a military leader, a prophet, and a judge, to free his chosen people, the Israelites, from Midian. And he did so and he took to the ground every Midianite. How did the Gideons get started? We got started by three traveling salesmen in Chicago, Illinois, in a hotel. They wanted to share God's word together have fellowship. When they were on the road traveling as traveling salesmen. That was in 1900. 1901, the first Testament distribution took place. Since that time, there's been two billion testaments handed into the hands of those looking for our Lord Jesus Christ. There are about 7.5 billion people on this planet. And since we've handed out 2 billion, we have 5.5 more to go. Now the devil doesn't take any days off and neither do the Gideons. So we will continue to distribute in over 200 countries around the world, also in commonwealths and possessions. Also, we like to distribute God's word in our own backyard. We recently had a wonderful distribution of testaments on the University of New Mexico campus. We also had a wonderful amount of Bibles handed out at the New Mexico State Fair. God's Bibles, as it says in Isaiah, and I paraphrase, they never return empty. Gideons are always looking for a few good men. There are requirements. You need to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be a businessman and a professional. You need to be in good standing in your church. You need to attend regularly. And you need to be recommended by your reverend. When you are, and we accept you, then we invite your wives to join our auxiliary branch, and we work cohesively as a team to spread God's word. I want to give you a testimony now about a man named Pat Sheldon. Pat was six years old. And he really wanted to have more time with his dad. And his dad was an alcoholic. His sister was an alcoholic. And his mother was missing in action. 
So he thought, well, I'll get my dad a, a beer. He's upstairs. So he went in the refrigerator and got him a cold beer, and his little hands weren't big enough to get the cap off, so he somehow pried it off. He ran up the stairs to his dad, and he said, Dad, look what I got for you. His dad looked at him and said, you opened it, so now you drink it. That's the first time little Pat got drunk. By the time he was 12 years old, he was selling dope in school. By the time he was 17 years old, he was collecting from drug dealers. And one day, he was being pursued by the police. And he had 35 pounds of meth in his backpack, $120,000 in cash on his front seat. And there were 12 police cars after him, two helicopters and a couple of police dogs. Well, you might say, needless to say, Pat went to prison. When he was sitting on his bunk one day, an old man in a brown suit came into his cell with a little Bible in his hand. He looked him in the eyes and he said, Jesus loves you and so do I. Well, old Pat, Thought to himself after this old man, Charlie Waters, left, he said, boy, if he really knew me, he wouldn't be saying he loved me because I'm a bad dude. A couple of weeks later, the prison warden said, you will come to chapel service. So he and the rest of the prisoners went to chapel service, and Pat sat over in the corner like he normally did. And while he was sitting over there, a big old tear welled up in his eye, kind of like it did in mine. And he didn't like that because he was a bad dude. He had burned down houses, blew up cars, collected from drug dealers, destroyed families, used dope, which he still did. But he kept thinking about this man called Jesus that the chaplain was talking about. He went back to his cell. He was tossing and turning. He couldn't sleep. And that night he got down on his knees and he prayed. And he said, Lord, if you'll take away this pain and you'll take away this addiction, I'll be yours. And about that time, he heard a voice that said, I love you and I forgive you. Well, old Pat jumped up off his knees. Of course, he didn't have anybody to talk to. He was in jail. So he laid there that night and he tossed and turned. He couldn't go to sleep. He didn't know what to do. So old Charlie Waters came back after about a week. He came into his cell. And Pat asked him what to do. And Charlie told him. He said, take that little Bible that I gave you and read 1 John. And he left. And Pat did read 1 John in that little Bible. And he read Peter. And the next time he saw Charlie... He said, you know, I read about John and I read about Peter, but this man called Jesus, he has got it going on. And old Pat accepted our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, he finished his sentence in some years later. And as he was going out to jail, he said, I'll never be back here again. Well, one year to the day. <laughs> God called him back to minister at that very prison where he was a prisoner. And he said to those people, for eight years, believe in Jesus Christ and it'll change your life. So there were many people, many people who left that prison in, in those eight years that he ministered that were different and their lives were changed. He left and went out into the world to preach the gospel. And he was asked, by a man at one of the times that he was preaching, how did you get changed, Charlie? And Charlie looked at him square in the eyes and said, there was one old man in a brown suit that came into my jail cell, and he said, Pat, Jesus loves you and so do I. That old man was a Gideon. So I, I say to you, 
um, today, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need your support. We need your donations to continue to preach and teach and witness and distribute the Word of God around the world. For about 10 bucks, you can get seven of these little Bibles. For 20, you can get 15. For 150, you can get a case of 100. So we'll be in the back with our open Bibles. And if you feel in your heart that you want to give us a donation to buy Bibles to distribute around the world and here in your own backyard, my prayer partner and I will be back there after the service. But I don't want you to give your tithes and offerings. Those belong right here in God's house. So I want to thank you for your time this morning. I want to thank your reverend Mull for, for allowing me to be here. And it's just an honor. God bless you and thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Now it's my turn. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'm, I'm part of Bible Study Fellowship, and so we as a group are studying the book of Matthew. So this is not all of, of my inspiration and my thoughts, but I thought it was really, really good, so I'm going to share it with you. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explains true righteousness goes beyond external behavior and includes the whole person. Purity in thought, purity in motives, purity in the intentions of the heart. Not just the outer man, but the inner person. It's a whole person of righteousness. And so we're looking a little bit at the outward behavior and the inner heart. Things can look pretty, pretty good on the outside, yet God is concerned with the heart and wants the whole person. We were on our way up to Santa Fe and uh, past one of the, the casinos and and uh, I learned that uh, one of the ladies in the car had gone to that casino to see the Chippendales. So I shared a long, long, long time ago, I had also gone to see the Chippendales. <clears throat> well, you know, uh, they looked great up there. I mean, you know, little white, little white tuxedos, you know, little shiny chests and everything. Well, in one of their numbers, they threw their coats off and they went up, down on the floor. One went right down, kind of near me. So I picked it up and I started to fold it up. That coat was filthy. There was grime around the collar. The cuffs were, were, were gray. It looked okay on the outside. But when you took a close look, it wasn't very pretty. So we're going to look at the bar Jesus set for his followers, a bar which is as perfect and whole as he is through and through. The bar and the impossibility of us to meet it. It's, it's meant for us to look at our own lives and realize we can't do it. We can't meet it. So how is it possible? And all this is meant to drive us to Jesus. 
Jesus came to perfectly fulfill righteousness and then put it into us so we can live to please him. So Jesus is, is teaching what the kingdom live, uh, kingdom of God looks like, what kingdom living is. And so these few verses state the goal of his ministry and foundation of his, of his ministry. So Matthew 15, 17 through 18 says, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter... Not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He goes on in verse 19 and 20. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless the, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into heaven. Now see, remember the officials of Judaism were very, very concerned with the law, representing what Yeshua was fighting against. Outer, outer verses and um, inner person behavior, motives. So how do we live righteously? And he begins with the idea of murder. Murder, most of us, I hope all of us, recognize murder's wrong. Murder is an outward behavior. And reading Matthew 5.21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And everyone who murders will be subject to judgment. It seems a little trivial because we believe that murder is wrong. But listen to the following scriptures, which looks at the insides and the inner motivations, feelings, impulses, and all these emotions and responses to circumstances can they do sometimes lead to murder. So, 522. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. I am so sorry to tell you, one of my favorite words to use in response to a circumstance I find unsatisfactory, idiot. Uh, somebody pulls up, idiot. The cat jumps, idiot. I try not to call my husband an idiot. <laughs> you know, that, that works for a good marriage, just saying. But last week I was talking, and unfortunately, you know where I learned this? I learned this from my, my granddaughter. Because she just looks, rolls her eyes and says, oh, what an idiot. Craig reminded me just last week I shouldn't do that. And wouldn't you know, scripture proved him right. Okay, M not murdering is probably not hard for most people, right? But being angry, calling people names, who's guilty of that? Yep, yep. But have you ever thought of those two as equal. Yeshua is, is teaching them and us. Our behavior says one thing, but our hearts influence our behavior. Anger, is that the root? A lot of times it's pride. Sometimes it's because we don't get our own way. Driving. Do you really want to yield? 
they, there was road construction. It took us two hours to get from Bernalillo to Santa Fe because of road construction. And, and, you know, it's supposed to work like a zipper. One car, one car, one car, one car. No, no. Somebody's always, and they were passing on the right-hand side too. Idiots. <laughs> okay. We need to be aware not only of our outward behavior, but the motivation which comes from within. So why does one murder? Jealousy. That's kind of a hard issue. Money. A physical, a physical issue. Greed. Heart issue. Anger. Heart issue. Pride, heart issue. Showing one's power, that's a heart issue. Jesus is taking the outward behavior of murder deeper, incorporating the heart's attitudes of hate, contempt of another person, and the abusive language that can accompany that and equals that to murder. So it begins with a thought or an emotion, and it can end in murder. So check your heart. Examine those relations which may be splintered or fractured. It is a heart issue rather than a behavior issue. If it is your behavior, honestly evaluate your feelings and your actions. What do you need to do to start to reconcile your relationships? Because isn't that the main message of Jesus? Reconciliation. Let us pray. Creator, we come before you. Help us to be mindful, not only of the words that come out of our mouth, but the thoughts the emotions, the state of our heart. Help us to live that we might always glorify you and make you real to other people. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And now please rise as you're able to as we go into our closing hymn today, number 2238 in the faith we sing, in the midst of new dimensions. We will be singing verses one and two and four and five. Journey now and ever, now and 
opportunities to spread God's word and God's love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.